Okay, so I think it's okay to get started now. People are still filing in, but we'll go ahead and kick it off. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today's breakout session on Telehealth 101. Uh, today we will be um, going over Telehealth 101, of course. A, a few housekeeping things. Um, your Q&A has been disabled on the Zoom platform, so have your video and audio. Uh, just so you know, please use the, I, I'm sure a few, a few of you have figured it out already, but please use the EventMobi app to ask your questions. Uh, today we have our presenter, Doris Barta. She is the program director for the Telehealth Technology Assessment and Resource Center. Uh, and our other presenter, Caitlin O'Connor, she is the counsel for the Nixon Law Group. And I'm going to kick it over to them for the presentation. Thank you, Ray. Um, so on behalf of my colleague, Caitlin and myself, we want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to visit with you today about Telehealth 101 and most specifically about how um, COVID-19 has affected telemedicine in our world. So Ray, if you will advance to the next slide, please. Just wanted to talk with you a little bit about who TTAC is. So TTAC is federally funded through the Office for Advancement of Telehealth. TTAC is one of the two national telehealth resource centers, or the other one is a policy resource center. And we have three staff. And so the two gentlemen who are in the picture on the left is Garrett Spargo, he is our PI. On the right is Jordan Berg, he is our technology specialist and he will also be presenting through these few days of this conference. And between the three of us, we have over 50 years experience in the telemedicine world. Next slide, please. So what does TTAC do? A lot of what TTAC does is we do um, technology showcases. Now, normally we bring the technology to you at the conferences so that you get an opportunity to look at the equipment, compare cameras, compare medical peripheral equipment. Unfortunately, this year we've not been able to do that. So what we do do is we do a virtual showcase, which we will be doing during this conference as well. So we, one of the things that we do is we are vendor neutral. So the showcases give you an opportunity to look at the equipment, examine the equipment, play with the equipment in, an, in a vendor neutral environment. And then Jordan and I are there to help you. So next slide, please. The other thing I wanted to talk with you about is the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. Now, Ray, who is our moderator, is a program director for the NCTRC. The NCTRC is comprised of all 12 regional telehealth resource centers and the two national telehealth resource centers. On the slide here is um, our website, and on the NCTRC website, we have numerous resources available to you. So I encourage you to take a look at, at the national website. Um, and the information that is on there is for anyone wanting to start a new telemedicine program or if they are wanting to expand a program that they already have. Next slide, please. So this map here is a map of the regional telehealth resource centers. That is actually a map that is on the NCTRC website. It's an interactive map. So if you want to find out information about the telehealth resource center that serves your state, all you have to do is click on that state and it'll take you directly to that telehealth resource center. So throughout this week or in the future, when you're looking at information that you may need regarding telemedicine, please utilize the telehealth resource centers and the NCTRC. Next slide, please, Ray. So now what I wanted to talk with you today about is the state of telemedicine technology, especially in the current COVID-19 crisis. We will be discussing trends in web-based video platforms that are designed for video technology. This includes security and privacy issues telehealth providers are having to navigate. We will be talking about the state of broadband connectivity in the United States and most specifically for our rural patient areas. 
<clears throat> we will be discussing technology and user considerations for providers and patients. And finally, we will leave you with some practical thoughts as you continue to make technology decisions related to COVID-19 or any other pandemic crisis. Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk with you a little bit about telemedicine platforms. The telemedicine world has experienced COVID-19 as both a disrupting and reinforcing force in the telemedicine market. I'm sure that you are not surprised that the amount of interest in telemedicine has increased significantly since this crisis began. Organizations are wanting to use telemedicine functionality set up as quickly as possible, and there is an increase in reaching to patients in their homes. For example, a colleague of mine told me that 100% of their pediatric patients are now using telemedicine technology, and 99% of their providers, their adult providers, are using it. So they went from 1,200 encounters a month to 44,000 clinical encounters a month. So you can see the significant increase in telehealth with the COVID-19 crisis. So what are some of the key features? COVID has moved many programs towards web-based video platforms because they can be set up quickly. While this is not a new trend, we've been tracking this for a while, but the accelerated pace of this movement has been shocking. The biggest changes that we are seeing are the rapid use of patient home as a care location. Now this means we are using the patient's equipment such as their tablets, smartphones, their consumer grade Wi-Fi, and their mobile networks. It also means using platforms that can connect with patients using simple connection methods like email, text message, or through a patient portal. So to that end, we are seeing more patients and providers expressing an interest in operating without the patient having to download a desktop application or create a mobile app account. So finally, many providers are wrestling with whether to pursue a general video platform that provides telemedicine application as well as basic conferencing, or are they going to invest in a more dedicated telemedicine solution that includes patient management, scheduling, and other clinical functionality? Next slide, please. So what are some of the key concerns? <clears throat> COVID has been a stress test to the telemedicine capabilities of organizations, service providers, and vendors. It has made us focus on several key features that are necessary for any rapidly deployed service. So deployability. How quickly can a new service or expanded service be deployed in a clinical environment? If you purchase a new platform or device, how soon will you be able to use it with your patients? Scalability. How rapidly can you move from seeing a dozen patients a week to a hundred or more patients a week using telemedicine? Does your network support the spike in traffic? Do you have enough software licenses to cover the spike in demand? Reliability. If you get a new service or device, how reliable will it be for the actual patient care over time? And ease of use. In addition to all of this, there are so many more providers and patients using these technologies, some that have never even considered using telemedicine previously. Having products that are simple to use and easy to train on is vital in delivering care that doesn't get bogged down by the technological issues. And in the middle of all of this, we need to be constantly thinking about security and privacy in telemedicine. Next slide, please. So we want to delve down into security and privacy because it's a hot button topic around telehealth and video conferencing in general as of late. So we are seeing two forces affecting security and privacy during the COVID-19 crisis. One is a relaxation of some of the HIPAA compliance and other regula regulations around platforms that can be used to deliver patient care. This has allowed clinicians and patients to connect and be reimbursed using non-traditional technologies, such as a cell phone. 
The Office for Civil Rights has published a notice about this type of technologies that are and are not, and are not appropriate for patient care. They have specifically mentioned FaceTime, Facebook Messenger video chat, Google Hangouts, Zoom, and Skype as potential platforms, although they do mention that this is not the total list. They also mention some platforms that should not be used, like Facebook Live, Twitch, and TikTok. Generally speaking, if the platform is designed primarily for broadcast or one too many communications, it is not a viable telemedicine platform under the discretionary notice. So overall, this relaxation of privacy rules is sure to be a temporary measure. And once a pandemic is over, we are going to need to adjust our care programs to more secure platforms. We are also seeing concerns raised over high volume video service providers in relation to security and privacy. Some of these issues are related to the users not understanding the security tools built into the products that they are using, or perhaps organizations not establishing effective procedures and controls over video conferencing, or other issues that point to a deeper problem in the way some of these video providers handle their data. Regardless, we are seeing growing pains as organizations, vendors, and consumers deal with these new ways of seeking and delivering care. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so now we want to talk a little bit about broadband. The internet infrastructure in the U.S. has held up surprisingly well in face of COVID-19. Reports from the FCC and other sources indicate an increase in traffic of about 30% as compared to pre-COVID traffic. This increase in demand is not only related to healthcare, but it also encompasses education. Many of us had to start teaching our kids at home. We, were, we are working from home where we didn't before and social distancing activities using the digital delivery, such as Zoom family meetings. While there have been some regional reports of slower access in high consumption areas in general, the U.S. broadband infrastructure seems to be adapting and expanding well. But one of the primary concerns that still is an issue is the disparity of broadband across and between rural and urban areas. The 2018 FCC broadband report states that 24 million Americans still lack access to broadband and speed internet, and 80% of that group is in rural or tribal areas. So the COVID crisis has taught us about how important digital connectivity is during a crisis, not only just for healthcare, but for nearly all aspects of our population's well-being. Next slide, please. So TTAC has been trending, tracking trends in video conferencing equipment. We are seeing organizations moving towards web and desktop based video solutions. Because of this, USB peripherals are becoming important for providers wanting to enter in, enhance their interactions with patients. As we continually ev evaluate this technology, we believe that providers improve their video experience by improving their audio solutions. Having a dedicated audio solution for the provider, like a USB speakerphone or headsets, can vastly improve the audio ex experience for both the patient and the provider. Audio solutions that create better recreations of the human voice allow a little more transparency in the technologies we use to connect the patients. Now these solutions, every one of these solutions that I've got up here on the screen today are less than $100. These low cost solutions can enhance overall experience. Secondly, it's often worthwhile to invest in a webcam peripheral for your device. Even a moderately priced webcam can provide a much better field of view, color accuracy, and clarity that is built in the laptop cameras. Next slide, slide please. <clears throat> One of the other trends that we have been monitoring is a rise of USB solutions that integrate audio, video, and other features into a single peripheral. 
A common marketing term for this type of technology is huddle space peripheral. These devices are designed for small or medium-sized conference rooms, but they can be used for clinical or group session platforms. In general, this, this sort of technology will have integrated microphone and speaker solutions, and many of them have pan, tilt, zoom functionality. Here in this slide, we have highlighted three systems that incorporate audio and video into the video conferencing system. The Logitech Studio, the Logitech Meetup, and the Meeting Room Owl. Now, when we do our virtual showcase with you, we will show these live, but at this point, we just have, we just have the, the slide. So when you're choosing a video platform solution, make sure that it is simple for the providers to use. If you want to scale rapidly and simply, you need intuitive and easy to use solutions that can be quickly set up and don't get in the way of patient care. If possible, it's wise to have clinicians involved in the technology selection because they have a different viewpoint than the administrative or IT professionals about what features are helpful in the platform. Next slide, please. So what I have here in this next slide is a comparison of the three cameras. So you can see the Logic Tech Meetup, that gives a little bit broader normal view. The studio gives you more of a face eye effect. And the Meeting Room Owl, which is to the right side, actually has a 360 view across the top of the camera. And that the Meeting Room Owl is actually designed to sit in the middle of a conference table where you would have six to eight people sitting around it. And it automatically turns to whomever is speaking. So it's a great tool for like a, a group meeting or something like that. And the audio is built into the, right into the Meeting Room Owl as well. Next slide, please. So I want to talk with you a little bit about engaging the patient. When working with the patient, we need to be flexible and understanding with our patients as we engage with them over the new technology. We will, mark, we will need to be using their existing technology in their home. So that means we're going to be using their phones, their tablets, and their laptops. We also will be using their Wi-Fi or cellular collect connections. So being able to guide our patients through how to get the most out of their technology is really important. It is worth stating that having a plan and integrating the plan in a calm and thought out process is important to reducing the stress of connecting. This can be as simple as having a backup connection plan or in many cases, reaching out and testing with the patient before we have our clinical encounter. So ensuring our patients and providers that this is a normal part of our care plan can go a long way in making this new process more comfortable. And that leads to our final patient thought. Develop a rapport with the patient and create a comfortable environment. Telemedicine works best when we can make the technology as invisible as possible. Next slide, please. So I would like to leave you with two sets of key thoughts. The first are some general concepts we address in almost every pre presentation we do about telehealth technology. The second set of thoughts are specific to the use of telemedicine in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is important that the technology chosen should support the needs and workflow of the organization and must be supported by the user. Technology for the sake of technology ends up in drawers covering dust. Spending hands-on time with a piece of technology is vital before you make any purchasing decisions. Most vendors will allow you to trial the equipment on a, on a limited basis before you purchase. So trying before you buy can be the difference between a successful and a failed program. And finally, get your whole team to buy into the chosen technology. As we stated earlier, your clinical staff, your administration, and your IT department have differing views on what makes a good telemedicine system. So you want to make sure that you collect their input and, and, de and document the details communicated before you purchase. 
This is vital to developing a successful telemedicine program. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so our final, final thoughts. Although the previous thoughts are just as much true during this COVID-19 pandemic, we also wanted to add some specific thoughts about how the use of telemedicine technology has changed over the past few months. So COVID-19 requires a flexible but robust response. Telemedicine is a great tool for reaching the existing patients that we can no longer see in person or who are at home because they're affected by the virus. This means we may be seeing them in their homes or on their mobile devices, using their consumer grade internet and mobile connections. It is important to be flexible, test connectivity when we can, and have backup op options for when things don't work. Reassuring the patients and providers that this flexibility as part of the plan can mitigate frustrations. And as we expand delivery of care using telemedicine, we are also expanding our risk. Unfortunately, this COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the challenges in getting new technologies to new users and new patients. It can be challenging to determine how potential partners are defining and managing risk on their ends. It is important that even in a crisis, we make effort to train and educate users on the technology we use, the controls we have in place, and the importance of their role in security and privacy. It is also important to work with our technology partners to make sure we have an understanding and insight into the risks. To use an analogy, telemedicine technology is a power tool, and we are handing this tool to our patients and our providers. If we can ensure they understand how to safely operate this tool, we can build useful care models. If we don't, we can cause a lot more harm than good. We need to have frank conversations with our technology partners to make sure that we have a common understanding of shared risks. Security and privacy is not a checkbox, it's a daily discipline. And I also want to state that we are living in a moment of time for just-in-time solutions. But it's, it's also important that as we select technologies and plan our care models, we are thinking about how this solution is going to work for us a year from now and even five years from now. As our patients, providers, and health systems rely on telemedicine to solve current problems, we can expect them to rely on telemedicine in the future. So what we build today will be what we will be using tomorrow. Next slide, please, Ray. So I just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk with you today about TTAC and telemedicine technologies. You can reach us through reaching out to our website. We have a technical assistant um, plug and play that you can push and ask your question, and then we will get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Next slide, please, Ray. So um, just want to say thank you from TTAC, myself and my colleagues, for giving us the opportunity to visit with you. Hopefully you will come to our technology showcase, which is I think July 7th. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin O'Connor, and she will take up the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Doris. Okay, so now that Doris has kind of talked you all through the exciting parts of telemedicine, the technology and all of that, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the more boring aspects of this, which are the laws and regulations and the rules that we need to be thinking about as we move forward in this post-COVID world. So next slide, please. This is just my legal disclaimer. Um, okay, so I have a couple of key points that I think are gonna be important for you all to take away from this presentation. And I wanted to put them to you at the outset so that you can keep an eye out for them as I start talking through some of the details here. So first and foremost, when you're thinking about telemedicine, it's always important to remember that the rules and reimbursement are going to look different at the state level versus the federal level. Most of what we're going to talk about today is going to be the federal level rules and Medicare reimbursement. Um, I will touch on some state stuff as well, but it's difficult to give a whole presentation about the state level rules because they differ from state to state. Um, 
The second key point is that prior to COVID-19, there were several restrictions to keep in mind when it came to providing and billing for telehealth services. But now, and this is point number three here, is during this COVID-19 pandemic, these opportunities have been drastically expanded at both the state and federal levels, and we're likely to see this continue. So I think one of the main takeaways, and we heard Doris talk about it as well, is that right now the opportunities in telemedicine have really never been greater. So I think that it's a perfect time to be having this conference and having this discussion here today. So let's dive in. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so just a quick overview of the Medicare and federal rules. Again, remember this right now, what we're talking about is pre-COVID. A lot of this has changed right now, and, and I'll get into what those changes are in just a second. So generally under Medicare, the way that telehealth is defined is as a service that is provided via live, interactive, synchronous audio and video technology. And these services are services that otherwise would have been furnished or reimbursed in a face-to-face -face encounter. So there's another set or group or category of services that I'm sure you all have heard about a lot, which would be remote patient monitoring, e-visits, virtual, other virtual services. Just know that what we're talking about today, telehealth is actually a different category than those other virtual services. Um, and there are a lot of sessions about those services, those virtual services happening, happening over the next couple of weeks as well. So if you're interested in that, definitely keep an eye out for those. Um, Telehealth generally under Medicare is also very, is also limited in geography and location. The patient must be at an eligible originating site, which we'll get into what that means in just a second. There has to be a pre-existing practitioner-patient relationship, which is typically formed via an in-person face-to-face encounter. Sometimes it can be via telemedicine, depending on the state, but most of the time it happens in person. Um, the services that can be provided via telehealth is also quite limited to a specific list of CPT codes that CMS puts forth each year. They do, they have been slowly expanding that list over time, but generally before COVID, it was, it was still a somewhat small list. Um, and then finally, to as a practitioner or a provider to bill Medicare directly for these services, you have to be uh, an eligible practitioner. And again, we'll talk about what that means in just a second. So next slide, please, Ray. Okay, so two terms that you're going to hear a lot when you talk about telemedicine are the distant site and the originating site. So the distant site, when we're talking about telemedicine, is the location of the practitioner at the time of the visit. The originating site is the location of the patient. So as you can see on the right side of the screen here, the originating site is somewhat limited in that the patient must be located at one of these locations that are listed here in order for the visit to be billable via telehealth. So for example, the patient can be at a physician or practitioner office, a critical access hospital, RHCs, FH or FQHCs, SNFs, community mental health centers, et cetera. It just has to be one of those locations on that list. On the left side of your screen, you'll see that the location of the practitioner isn't quite as limited. The practitioner can kind of be wherever they want to be when they provide services. However, they do have to be one of these practitioners that are listed here. So you'll note that physical therapists are not included here, audiologists, speech language pathologists, um, clinical social workers, many actual mental health providers are not on that original list. So it's, it's, it's somewhat limited there as well. It's got to be a physician, NP, PA, or, or one of the other providers that are listed there. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit more detail on the originating site and the geographic restrictions. So in addition to what we just talked about with the patient having to be located at a particular type of facility, that facility also has to be in either a county that is outside of a metropolitan statistical area or a health professional shortage area in a rural census tract. So both of these terms are defined by Medicare in a little bit more detail that I'm not gonna go into today just because 
honestly, during COVID, it's not as important anymore. And I think that going forward, we'll probably see that, that these restrictions might continue to be relaxed. Um, but just note that these are, two, these are two requirements that will have to be followed. If you want more detail on that, you can always reach out to me or you can just check the CMS website and there will be lists of eligible locations that uh, the patient can be located in. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about reimbursement. As a provider, you know, if you want to be providing telehealth services to your patients, you also need to know like what you're going to get paid for those services. Is it the same as an in-person visit? Is it different? How does that work? So generally speaking, the distant site practitioner, again, that is the practitioner that is treating the patient via telemedicine, not the, pa not the provider that might be located at the facility where the patient is also located. So as a distant site practitioner, you will bill the services provided and receive that reimbursement from Medicare. These codes are your typical CPT codes or HIPPX codes that get billed for in-person services. It's just that you will have to add some modifiers potentially or indicate the place of service as 02 to indicate that it was provided via telehealth. But generally speaking, the codes are the same that would be used for in-person services there, it's just a more limited list. Uh, the originating site can receive an originating site fee via HICPIX code Q3014 in order to recoup some of the costs that you incur by having that patient in your facility and providing them with technology, et cetera. For 2020, that originating site fee is about $26.65. Generally speaking, uh, Telehealth services are reimbursed at the same rate as an in-person visit, although that may differ somewhat. That is the general, the general reimbursement level. Um, and then just remember that a 20% copay, just like with all other Medicare services, is always going to apply here. Unfortunately, that is a statutory requirement, so it's not something that can be waived on a regular basis. Um, oh, back one slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's the more fun part of all of this. After we talk about all those limitations, now we get to talk about what has been changed during COVID-19 and why Doris and I are telling you that these opportunities have expanded so much during this time. So this is kind of a long list here. I'll pull out some of the most important ones that you'll wanna keep in mind. First and foremost, during COVID-19, there are no more geographic rural originating site restrictions. This means that the patient can now be located at their home, they can be at their children's house, they could be at a friend's house, outside in their backyard, really anywhere. There is no longer that limitation on where the, the patient is located. This does mean that as an originating site, you don't, you don't get to bill the originating site facility fee, that Q3014 that we just talked about. But generally speaking, it's, it's not going to really apply anyway because, again, the patient can just be at their home. Uh, and, and also, I'll note that these changes right now during COVID-19 are temporary during the public health emergency as declared by the administration. We don't yet know if and when those changes are going to change, but I do have some insight for you as to what this might look like going forward. So I'll, let, I'll, I'll touch on that at the end of this as well. Uh, there's no longer a pre-existing practitioner patient relationship required. Providers can now engage telemedicine, engage in telemedicine visits with brand new patients. The providers can also now waive the 20% copay that we just talked about. So where normally it would be only allowed in very limited circumstances for a provider to waive that copay, now providers can do it on a broader basis, but again, it is temporary. And one thing to keep in mind about that is that as the provider, if you just if you decide to waive that copay, you're still only getting paid 80% of the full reimbursement from Medicare. So you essentially have to eat that 20% amount that you're waiving. However, the copay can sometimes be a barrier to adoption for the patient. So you may want to look at you know, the, the cost benefit analysis there and whether or not it's gonna be worth it for you to waive that copay to make sure that your patient is getting access to care and also that um, you're able to continue to provide the services that you would normally provide in person. Um, so Doris already talked about the OIG penalties that have been reduced or removed for different platforms that can be used. I won't go into detail there. 
Um, and then another really exciting change is that now any practitioner that is eligible to bill Medicare can provide services via telehealth. The list of services is still limited, although as you'll see on the right side of the screen, it has been significantly expanded during COVID. Uh, CMS has added over 80 additional codes to that list that existed prior to COVID. And they've also noted that they're accepting requests on an ongoing basis from stakeholders to add codes to that list. So if you're a provider and there's a particular service that you want to provide to a patient or that you think your patients might need, it is a good idea to just reach out to CMS and say, hey, this is why I wanna provide this service. This is the code. Can you please add this to the list? They've noted that they're gonna be very open to these requests and likely add them again on an ongoing basis or a rolling basis as they receive those requests. Just note that it will be a temporary add to that list most likely. Um, but so you'll note that although that list is still limited, the list of eligible practitioners is not. And now physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, providers like LCSWs that can bill Medicare directly in other instances can also now do so via telehealth during this temporary COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, another interesting change is that now licensed providers can provide care outside of the state in which they are enrolled in Medicare, but you have to keep in mind those state licensure rules, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, FQHCs and RHCs, where previously they could act as the originating site, they could not be separately reimbursed for the services that they provide via Part B. Now, during this COVID-19 public health emergency, they can. So this, again, opens up that opportunity for FQHCs and RHCs and patients located in very rural areas to improve their access to care through telemedicine where they were not able to do so before the pandemic. Um, note that the, the reimbursement for FQHCs and RHCs is going to be an average national rate of $92 and is not included in the air payment or the PPS payment that those facilities get. Um, okay, and, and uh, we talked about before how telehealth generally has to be uh, audiovisual synchronous technology. There are some allowances now for audio only technology to be used. So a phone call if necessary in certain for certain select services. Um, and there's a link on this slide. I think you guys should be getting the slides after this. There is a link to the list of services that are eligible to be billed via telehealth if you click on that 80 plus more codes. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, very quickly, I will talk about some state and private payer uh, rules to keep in mind. The first is that Medicaid, although it is somewhat similar to Medicare, Medicaid is run on a state by state basis, which means that all of the reimbursement and the rules that will apply will be different from state to state. So if you are dealing with Medicaid patients, in particular children or disabled children, you'll want to consult your state Medicaid program to get a good understanding of what your reimbursement might, like, might be like for providing those services. It, like Medicare though, Medicaid is often limited to particular provider types, a particular list of services, and um, again, it's a state-by-state -state determination of, of what's reimbursed. The commercial and private payer uh, area is a little bit more of a gray area because commercial and private payers can kind of do what they want and reimburse how they want. Though some states at this point, I believe it's about 40, uh, have enacted what is called a parity law, which essentially means that even those private payers have to reimburse for telehealth in the same way that they would reimburse for in-person services. So uh, again, it's only 40 states though, so you'll want to take a look at your state laws and your commercial payer contracts to understand what your reimbursement might look like if you provide services via telehealth. Many commercial and private payers during COVID at least have allowed for the waiver of copays and deductible requirements. Some have even done so on a general basis. Um, again, you'll just need to check with your payer to understand that. Um, during COVID-19, a lot of the updates that have taken place are very similar to those that have taken place under Medicare. Many states are expanding their reimbursement, so that list of services where previously it would have been pretty limited, many states are expanding that during COVID-19 just like Medicare has. 
And then finally, may, many states have also waived or reduced the state licensure requirements to make it easier for out-of-state providers to treat in-state patients. So the way this works in a lot of states is the state will say any provider that is licensed as, say, a physician in another state can provide services via telehealth to patients in our state. Some states are limiting that right now. For instance, I believe California is limiting this uh, to treating patients that have either been exposed to or diagnosed with COVID-19. Some states, however, have expanded on a much broader basis to allow for out-of-state providers to provide essentially any services that they want to the patients. So, uh, okay, so that is my last slide, but the last thing I want to leave you all with is a brief discussion about what all of this might look like when the COVID-19 public health emergency ends. One thing to note is that the public health emergency was declared by the President of the United States. It can only be ended by the President of the United States. So in terms of when it will end, like I said earlier, we don't really know. However, my colleague attended a Senate hearing the other day uh, with the Senate Health Committee, if any of you are familiar with that, where the main focus of that committee hearing was on, um, was on telehealth and the future of telehealth and what it may look like if and when, or when the um, public health emergency ends. So the good news is a lot of that discussion was focused on reducing or removing those geographic and originating site restrictions going forward to allow for telehealth to continue to be provided to patients regardless of where the patient is located which again will, will significantly open or keep the floodgates open for telehealth to increasingly become more and more adopted with patients and providers alike. So that was, that was a really exciting change that I think we can probably count on seeing at least on some level um, as, is again, a significant reduction in those geographic limitations. The other thing that was discussed was keeping that list of services also significantly expanded, although probably not to the extent that it is expanded right now. However, we can probably expect to see it remain a little bit more open than it was prior to the public health emergency. Um, so I think that's all I have there. If we want to open it up to questions now, and, and I'm happy to answer any follow-ups you have on all of that. but think that was a general overview of, of everything you all can expect if and when you start using telemedicine. All right, thank you, Caitlin. So now we're gonna be moving into the Q&A session. Uh, before we get started, I wanna apologize again for the technical difficulties that we had earlier in the presentation. Uh, a, a few of you might've missed this, but please use the event Mobi application to submit your questions. Um, I'm currently monitoring it, so we'll give it a second to get people um, familiarized with that platform and see if any questions come through because we haven't received any yet. It does also look like one of the attendees has raised her hand, Brianne. I'm not sure if, Brianne, if you want to submit a question via the app or if there's a way to allow her to talk. Um, yeah, kind let me... Kind of up to you, Ray, but I did see those a couple of people raise their hands. All right, I'm not seeing any questions come through the Q&A function. So while we wait for that, I think I can allow attendees to talk. So I see someone has their hand raised. I'm going to allow them to talk. I see it's um, S. Ryan. I'm sorry, I don't have your full name being presented on Zoom, but you should be able to talk right now. Go ahead and try and unmute your mic if you can. So just to clarify, do you think I'm with a um, I'm with um, Arlington Free Clinic, and we use a lot of retired providers, and so the telemedicine is a um, an option for us because many of our providers won't be coming back to the clinic until we probably have a vaccine. So, um, do you think that the um, in your opinion, do you think that the legislation will still be eased so that providers in other states, you know, can do the telemedicine? Uh, are you referring to the licensure requirements yes, that I mentioned yeah. at the end? Yeah, yeah, so it's hard to tell because each state is going to be able to make its own decision there. 
Um, I know that some states have already started entering into what's called a licensure compact, which you may be familiar with, which essentially allows for all of the states that are providers licensed in one of the states that have signed on to that compact to provide services across state lines. Um, I, I, I would not count on a national removal of those licensure requirements at this time. But, but I think that we can probably expect some type of increase in those, in those maybe those multi-state licensure compacts. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and Doris, you may have an opinion on that as well if you wanna jump in, but that's just kind of what I'm seeing at this point. Yeah, no, I think you answered that quite well. I, I think that um, what's going to be interesting is we've moved into a new realm of using different kinds of technologies, and I don't think that's going away. I think yeah. we are going to move more and more into the mobile health environment, and we are going to be really looking at broadband capability where we haven't looked at it before. So. I see that as part of the movement now that's not going to change. Yeah, that was actually discussed. The broadband issue was discussed at that Senate hearing the other day as well. At least that's my understanding. And that is one issue that there is not quite as much bipartisan support for at this time. So it's certainly something that will need to become more of a focus as, as we go forward. And I think for sure it will. Thank you. All right, perfect. So uh, I'm not seeing any questions coming in through the chat function. So why don't we go ahead, if you're an attendee, why don't you try raising your hand if you have a question? I'll go ahead and let you talk. And I think if you're an attendee, you should be able to raise your hand by um, accessing it, accessing the participants tab through your Zoom platform they should give you an option to raise your hand. While we wait, I'm pulling up my notes from that Senate hearing as well to see if there's anything else that might be helpful to talk about. Oh, so, so Doris, I know that you mentioned the use of um, Facebook Messenger and Skype and Zoom for provision of telehealth services. And that was actually something that was discussed at that Senate hearing as well. I think that you were spot on when you said that we can expect to probably not have the doors remain that open going forward. Although it does sound like they the Senate at least is interested in um, keeping some of that those restrictions relaxed. So there is some possibility that some more common apps will be available as well. All right, so that was perfect information. We'll give it one, maybe 30 more seconds to see if there's any questions that come through. I haven't seen anything in the chat box yet. Oh, here we go. Another raised hand. Again, from S. Ryan. I'm going to go ahead and let you talk. All right, you should be good to go. OK, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, hi. So um, sorry I'm missing so many questions. But Doris brought up about, um, you know, the interesting issue of broadband. And as a free clinic, you know, we are now using uh, telemedicine and we're talking to our patients, you know, in their homes, anywhere, work, on the street. And, you know, and there's a lot of problems with sometimes those calls, they get stuck. Is there a way or do you know of a tool that helps to assess uh, your patient's broadband or telemedicine capability? Um, Part of the, one of the things that we had talked about earlier was to do an assessment, you know, do a, a trial with a patient in the home prior to having your clinical exam because every place is different. Now they can actually do a speed test on their home and home broadband capability to see what the speeds are. 
but then that depends on what time of the day that you're using it. If you're using it during the time of day that you've got four or five kids in the home also using the internet, or you've got two or three people in the home using it, um, then that's going to that's gonna slow down your capability in your clinical encounter. So all of that kind of stuff plays a role in what your broadband capability are, is when you're using the consumer grade broadband. So a lot of times what we see is that people will be actually using their cell phone because their cellular connectivity is, is better than their Wi-Fi in their home because of all of those things. So the best thing to do is to do a trial test of connectivity prior to your clinical exam so that you can get an understanding of, of what your capacity is within that home environment. The, the other, for us, the other um, complicating factor is we often use interpreters and scribes. So you'll have four people on a call and it, that seems to affect it too. But we're just all learning how to deal with it. Yeah, and that's why we said, you know, we need to have flexibility. We need to just kind of laugh if something didn't work. For example, if the video isn't working, pick up the phone. That needs to be part of your clinical flow process is to think through all of those issues that might actually occur during a, a, a video encounter. Um, helping a, a consumer understand placement of their technology so that you're, you have a good view of them. Um, all of that stuff comes into play when you're working with a home environment. Thank you. All right, so we are short on time and I'm, I'm very sorry. We do have one question that came in through the chat asking about verbal consent. Uh, I think we're gonna have, we don't have time for it, so I'm sorry about that. You're free to reach out to our speakers. Uh, I, before we leave, I wanna mention one more thing. Please let us know what you thought of this session. Uh, this should be accessible through the Event Mobi app. As you can see here, there's a session feedback button that you can click on. Again, please uh, fill, um, fill out that form. We do appreciate your feedback. And uh, thank you to our presenters for a great session and we hope to see you soon. Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks everyone.